All right. Um, I'm Blake Martin from Colorado. I get the pleasure of presenting right before lunch. Um, so I'll try to be as uh, precise with my language as I can. Uh, our group was what CDS tools are going to move the needle in the next five years. And during our uh, self ideation in the first couple of minutes, I think a lot of things came up. There were some disease specific, um, you know, CDS goals, sepsis, early warning systems. Uh, but what, what really came out of it was that we want systems that are interpretable, that give us and give clinicians and trainees uh, information about how a CDS tool or algorithm is arriving at the recommendation that it's providing. Um, and not just uh, that interpretability, but also transparency. So how accurate is it? How confident is it in the suggestion that it is making? Um, and then interoperability as well. Um, we, and so part of it also being like evidence-based, like so what is the evidence basis for a given CDS tool? Um, where has it been trialed? Where has it been validated? We want this information to be readily available. Um, we sort of shifted in terms of like what type of prototype we wanted away from disease specific tools and more towards what is a sort of new method of interacting with the electronic health record or with that data in a way that is gonna be very easy to query, very easy to obtain, and that's gonna be able to give us relatively real time input uh, and decision support for our patients. So uh, the prototype that we came up with <clears throat> Uh, will be a CDS tool that has available to it all of the information within the electronic health record. Um, additionally, uh, sort of evidence-based medicine, based best practices, local protocols, and that is something that is able to be queried in a conversational form. Um, so uh, not just searching the chart for echo or steroids, but actually walking into the patient room, asking, asking with your voice, you know, not Siri, but we, we need to come up with a name for the CDS tool, and it needs to have a British accent also is something that we had decided on. <laughs> um, so HAL 2.0, uh, <laughs> as you walk in, say, um, this patient is tachycardic. Uh, I want to know information about what happened the last time they got a fluid bolus. When was that fluid bolus? What happened to the heart rate in your, your output about that uh, after that? So we wanted it to be uh, conversational, interactive, whether that's ch uh, chat-based or voice-based. Um, also, the idea of displaying data visually, whether that's in the patient room, on a smart wall, or on your computer or cell phone. Um, like show me the heart rate trend over the last you know 12 hours um, have our coag studies or lactates come back what what signs of organ dysfunction are there and then you would get both visual representations but also potentially voice information in a conversational manner and an answer to the question that you were asking um, a couple of uh, components to the tool that we were looking for would be uh, sort of historical patient response so that example i just gave what what happened the last time we gave a fluid bolus to this patient um, but also sort of general responses. So given my patient's phenotype, uh, what are evidence-based practices? Um, the patient has hypotension, elevated lactate. Um, you've already given this much fluid, you're not seeing response. The next steps would be vasoactive, just as a general example. Um, additionally, and this is getting a little bit more advanced, but could we simulate the patient response? So, uh, you know, HAL 2.0, what is gonna happen if I go up on the PEEP by two? Will I get an, uh, an oxygenation benefit? Um, and then giving you sort of different likelihoods of that patient outcome based on the, uh, uh, I guess, proposed intervention. Um, a couple other things we talked about. So being able to display the relevant literature or your um, site-specific guidelines or protocols, say, you know, show me our sepsis protocol or show me my protocol for giving, you know, TPA through a chest tube. Um, and then, again, this is getting more advanced, but are we able to learn from clinician decisions? So when the CDS tool recommends that we put in a chest tube or recommends that we change the ventilator settings and we say, actually, you know, I'm not gonna do that because of this, is the CDS tool able to learn from that, incorporate that information into uh, subsequent decision support? Um, we discussed uh, sort of transparency of the underpinnings of prediction. This gets back to that sort of interoperability, or sorry, uh, interpretability and transparency. So uh, if it recommends giving a fluid bill, say, well, where is that prediction you know, coming from? And then they can give you information on the phenotype of the patient or what happened the last time they got a fluid bolus, for example. Um, we already mentioned British accent, so I'll skip that. Uh, <laughs> um, and sort of visual and voice output, so that whether you are in your office, you're on rounds, you're in the patient's room, having a visual response to a query, um, I think is something that was very commonly held within the group, is that that interface is something that is gonna be much more helpful. Instead of interruptive BPAs, we are querying the 
you know, the tool for specific advice or specific information. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things that came up was, could you have a separate family-facing version of the tool? So the family could ask, um, you know, what what are my patient, what are my son's labs doing today, or what uh, what was my daughter's most recent lactate, or what antibiotics is my child receiving, and being able to get that information readily without having to ask the nurse, wait for the clinician to arrive at the bedside, and so separate tools for the family and the care team that are able to enhance parents' understanding of their patient's care and trajectory. Um, so a lot of. Uh, um, different skills that we're gonna to need to develop, but I think the idea of having this different interface for clinicians to interact with and query the electronic health record is something that could really move the needle in the next five years. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. What? Um, anything else from the group that I missed that people wanted to add on? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> I mean, this brings us all back full, full circle with the first presentation by Mike Dean on, on chat, the perils of chat GPT, but can we make PQ GPT work for us in this way? That would be amazing. I love the idea. I really took like three pictures. I'll patent it. Yeah. I, so. So I, I, I like this, and I, like, I especially like the family-facing idea, too. And I think for version 2.0, why wait for me to ask the question? Can it predict what the next question would be or what the you know, few possible mm -hmm. next questions would be, yeah. um, or even some that I'm not thinking to ask that would be relevant? I still the fact that not allowed to ask good or bad. I find it really interesting that you didn't focus as much on the interruptive clinical decision support and more on the sought clinical mm -hmm. decision support. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, we didn't say this out loud, but uh, we, well, I guess we did discuss how BPAs, we usually just sort of click through and we're like, yeah, I know that, or I don't care right now because I have something more urgent to do. Um, so that was sort of an underpinning to it is, could we develop a system where we seek the information first? And then if that is well accepted, I agree like a version, HAL 2.0 could then provide more sort of real time ideas and predictions. And that would probably be uh, better accepted at that point if people had a very good experience with the first sort of query based system. Like quick comment, just to expand on your aspiration, maybe 3.0. But the way VPS becomes different, because anyone can make this uh, app that you're suggesting, use guidelines, I don't know what evidence-based means, but where VPS is very different um, is you actually get a cohort-based historic data. So if you walked in into a room with a five-year-old with BMT with high-grade fever, you could instantly press the green button concept, which is not new, and the VPS would query the two million patients and which ones match your patient and what was the historic data from those patients. It's a bit like having your attending who has the you know, experience and says, in my time we had this. You turn it into <laughs> a much more data because each one has their own memory, but you're now replicating a cohort-based historical. I'd love to know how many of them responded to uh, fluid boluses, how many of them got uh, ECMO, how many of them. So you know that's, that's yeah, a flavor of evidence which is historic. Yeah, we did discuss how you know this uh, age, you know, agent, whatever, would sort of function as a very trusted colleague that you're sort of asking for um, historical response on. So yeah, general, so evidence based, but also sort of general response, like you were saying. And I didn't get into this, but yeah, you have a five year old with pneumonia and hypotension. What are the different conditions I should be worried about or tests I should be ordering? So how uh, afraid are you of this tool? You know, just reinforcing your biases and your current knowledge and spitting out like what you think is the gospel but you know tomorrow you find out that all of that really isn't isn't right so how like how do you how do you uh control for like this re this positive reinforcement 
of your biases and in, in that you've been coded into your into your medical record. Yeah, so sort of automation bias and just blindly following the, the CDS recommendation. Um, I, I mean, I think that's got to be part of the next generation of CDS tools is that it has to be explanatory and interactive. So if something doesn't seem right, not only is the you know trainee or whoever is using it sort of understand where the prediction is coming from, but also be able to point out, you know, actually that reasoning doesn't have a good physiologic basis to it. It's going to be challenging, no doubt. Do you let a family ask when or if my child will go home? So I wanted to actually comment on what Rishi said, because I think it goes back to what Nilesh was just saying. You can imagine years down the road having almost like a similarity score. And so for every patient you have like, you know, here are the 20 most similar or 100, whatever, most similar children in the PDC data sets. And here's what the clinicians did and here's what happened. And so then it's not based on necessarily preconceptions other than that's a little bit of sort of circular logic. But, you know, of the last 100 kids, uh, 80 of them got a fluid bolus and only 40% responded and 20 didn't. And actually those kids went on to ECMO much less frequently than the kids that did get it. So like maybe you should pause before giving the fluid bolus that you're sort of reflexively doing. Um, I'd also like to trademark the name since this is half Alexa and half a fellow, Felexa as the name. <laughs> <laughs> Patent pending. Do you, keep, uh, do you keep race out of your model? Um, or out of the CDS, right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's tough. Even if you do, there are markers within the electronic health record that can still propagate bias, not just in machine learning tools, but CD, certainly CDS based on those as well. Um, so, I mean, I think there's got to be very frequent evaluation and recalibration to make sure that you're having equitable patient outcomes across those groups. So having it be verbal and possibly displayed on a screen in the room makes it inherently much more transparent, like your thought process, what are you interested, what are you looking at, it's more transparent to the, the family and the patient that's in the room. Um, my first question is, was that, is that something that you guys considered? Um, and the second question is, would that fact change the way you implement it or would it change the way you used it? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I know everybody practices differently. I I'm personally very straightforward when I don't know what's going on or I sort of think out loud. Um, haven't gotten any complaints yet. But, um, I, I, you know, I think if you're using those tools in the room in front of the parents, because it's an acute, probably more of an acute situation, and I think my hope is that they would respond positively to us using all the tools we have available to, you know, make good decisions. But it's going to be, that would be very different. It'd be a very different change. Super. Any one last comment, question, concern before we yeah, move yeah, to lunch? Yeah. yeah. So, do you want uh, the uh, uh, parent uh, uh, who uh, used uh, this thing that Mike talked about uh, to come to you every day and say, "This is what I want you to do," because this is clearly the trajectory is uh, uh, family-centered care is one thing, but family-directed care is another thing and I can see this thing just uh, uh, resulting in this every day on rounds arguing about <clears throat> are you going to do what the parents tell you to do or are you going to be a doctor? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know how different that is from it is now from the way it is now honestly. <laughs> it, it varies by family. But that's a fair point as these sort of predictive tools become more available to everybody that's going to be something we're going to have to deal with, whether it's through this CDS system or not. Uh, and yeah, I think that is that's going to be challenging, and we're going to have what to be would very be, good What would be the point of investing uh, 20 years of your life into uh, becoming a doctor and, and and training for it? Is, is our field going to be um, uh, archaic, and uh, there will be a new uh, way of doing medicine of of um, people who uh, just do things uh, mm. after listening to somebody tell them what to do. Right. 
yeah, I think that's the the challenge of CDS going forward from an educational perspective and just like global view of our field is what our physicians going to be if we just sort of learn to follow these tools. And I think that's why it's so important that, uh, you know, as leaders in CDS that we are building into these tools, educational components to it um, and still prioritizing our traditional medical ed education so that they have a good you know, foundation of medical knowledge to know when a tool should not be blindly followed. But it, it's going to change the field a lot. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it's still a loop, right? There's still a decision between the, the advice and the action and the, and the decision mm -hmm. that you make Um, as, as time goes on, the, de the demands and expectations placed on our field, I mean, there's just more knowledge out there that we don't know. So we have to exist somehow. And, you know, the, the, the chat GPT or the automated systems or whatever, I, I, I've seen idiocracy, so I'm, I'm jaded about what the future is <laughs> going to look like. But the... Uh, you know, the way I see this kind of evolving is it, it's there's going to be the haves and the have nots and the have nots are going to have the automated care that does an OK job most of the time and, and gets them there. And then there's going to be the haves getting care by, you know, people that went to school and trained to do more advanced care. And then there'll be some kind of, you know, transition between the two. But a lot of the automated care that's coming. And I think that in the future, ICU is probably going to be one of the last places that it happens, but it's going to happen. So, so I have a question and a comment. You'll notice there are no human doctors in the Star Wars movies. They're all robots. Yeah. Right. So, therefore, please incorporate Isaac Asimov's three laws of safety <laughs> in the CDS. Thank okay. Noted. <laughs> And anybody could run them instead of Dr. McCoy. But physicians have been part of the human race or healers. And whether they were priests, shamans, or witch doctors, they have always been required. I'm happy to give the burden of what a computer can think and do on somebody crunching the numbers and gathering the data to the robot. But I have a feeling that the patients are still going to want to talk to a human being who has more depth of understanding and compassion and knowledge about how to deal with maybe what the disease means to their future. Um, so I'm not that threatened. I'm looking for, <laughs> I'll be retired before then. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to my doctor spending time talking to me um, and, and not running around trying to uh, talk to Siri or a fellow. I'll be happy if he's wearing glasses with lights flashing and an earpiece and he's conveying to me what my problems are as we talk. Um, and he can diagnose uh, Rigelian spinal fever very quickly. That's Dr. McCoy. <laughs> <laughs>